Well, uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Latif and Dr. Lynn, uh, for what I'm sure is going to be a very informative discussion. Uh, to provide an overview first for those who are connecting virtually, we hope that you're all able to hear and follow but we know, given current network overloads, um, that it may be a problem. So we do plan to post content for this uh, for general access sometime tomorrow. So after I provide some brief introductions for Dr. Latif and Dr. Loon, they will be giving uh, remarks, incorporating slides. And then I'll ask them prepared questions that have been submitted in advance from our members. But first, I want to start by thanking Dr. Latif and Dr. Lynn, um, and for all the healthcare professionals and first responders who are tirelessly working right now on the front lines of this crisis, uh, we are deeply indebted to all of you. So thank you very much. Um, now for introductions. Dr. Omar Latif became the CEO of Rush University Medical Center in May of 2019. He previously served as the Chief Medical Officer of the Medical Center and of Rush University System for Health. And as Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Latif helped design, implement, and oversee initiatives related to clinical quality, patient safety, and performance improvement. Under his leadership, Rush has performed exceptionally well in a number of national rankings, including CMS and U.S. News and World Reports. Dr. Latif uh, currently serves as a Professor of Pulmonary in critical care medicine, and he received his medical degree from Des Moines University and completed his internship and residency at New York University Downtown Hospital. Now on to you, Dr. Michael Lynn. Um, you are a healthcare epidemiologist at Rush, specializing in infectious diseases, and you worked with the support of the CDC to improve the surveillance of healthcare acquired of infections and prevent the spread of multi-drug resistant viruses. Um, you serve as an associate professor at the Department of Internal Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases at Rush Medical College, and you received your medical degree from David Geffen School of Medicine in UCLA and completed residency at University of Chicago Hospital. So thank you so very much for joining us. Now, Dr. Latif, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you for having both of us. Um, we're excited to do this presentation and excited to have uh, a, a bi-directional conversation to the extent that we can, recognizing the limitations of technology. All right, um, so we're going to provide a coronavirus update, um, and we're excited to do this. This is a, a sign you'll see when you're driving off of 290 um, today. It says, wash your hands, which is an important theme that we'll get to throughout the course of the conversation, but overwhelmingly, one of the biggest questions we get are what are the things that we can do to mitigate our own chances of getting an infection? And we decided rather than to keep answering it, we would put this in, out in every way we could uh, to share it openly as much as we could. You know, we'll start really by just briefly talking about coronavirus um, in general, and then we'll get more detailed over what are the things that we can do right now as a society to help fight this. Um, it began in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. There were some reports in the end of November or mid to end of November. And we know that they, for the first time, were able to report no new cases yesterday. So this has been a journey for the entire country and for that population. The most common symptom of COVID-19, or also the coronavirus, are fever, tiredness, and dry cough. Some patients have aches and pains. Uh, nasal congestion, runny nose, sore throat, or diarrhea. You don't have to present with these in any specific order. And every day you see a new blog coming out with someone saying, well, I didn't have this, but I had this, or I didn't have this, and I had this. And so what we know is these are very generalized symptoms that are synonymous with a common cold that can progress into a pretty intense fever and for a small, um, unfortunate percentage of people into a roaring pneumonia. Um, it's spread by respiratory droplets and surfaces, and we can talk about this in some detail as we move on. And uh, most estimates of the incubation period or how long it lives in a body are around two weeks. And you could be infective at any point during that entire time. And that is the reason why you're seeing so many of these reports pushing for people to stay inside or basically living in a bubble for a two-week period, and then we can reassess as a society where we're going. So in general, it, symptoms that are nonspecific, symptoms that spread through respiratory droplets and on surfaces, 
and symptoms that are extremely contagious. The reason they're extremely contagious is you're, you've heard a lot about the word novel or a new virus. This is a virus where nobody has immunity to. We are all very susceptible to getting this infection. And there are predictions that I'm sure you've all read that say that 70% of the population will at some point have had this infection over the next six months to one year. There's so many different predictive models out. Our hope is to not add to those, but to provide some color and detail as to why there's different models out and what the real challenges are with infections like this. Here's a heat map that Johns Hopkins University pumps out every day. And this is a remarkable graphic, which really just traces the number of confirmed test positive cases in the world. And when you look at this, it gives you an indication of how rapidly it's spreading. If you looked at this 10 days ago, it was dramatically different. And if you looked at it at the end of January, it would light up with only one region of the world, which was the Far East. There were people very intelligent people that have issued reports in January and February that this was nothing to be concerned about in many different countries, including countries in Europe, where people talking to themselves 10 days ago in videos would say, I wish I took this more seriously. This graph is continuing to get more red over time. Now, we know that in areas that they've contained this, it will get less red and that will get smaller. But for the most part, it's in a spreading phase. And we'll talk about that as we move on into why. There's been a lot of comparisons to the flu and coronavirus, a lot. And, and I'll just ask you here in a very clear way to not make those comparisons. It is not like the flu. And while early on some of the symptoms of being nonspecific can be flu-like and it can be hard to differentiate, what you see from these two graphs is the COVID graph to the right shows a markedly higher mortality. Patients who are elderly, look at the 80 plus population, have a 15% chance of dying once they get this infection, and an 8% between 70 and 79. And when you look at that in the other population, it's less than 1%. So a 15 times more lethal chance of dying in, the, in, in, a, in an elderly population than the flu. We know that when you do hear about the flu, and we've heard about this at every level of this country, that the flu takes out and has a high mortality. But at the end of the day, this has a 15 times higher mortality in that elderly population. We're gonna spend the most time talking about this graph here and um, because this is the most important graph that you'll be able to see. And I'm sure you've seen this because while we can quote one source, which is from the CDC, this is in just about everything you look at right now in the country. What this graph shows you is that if you have an uncontrolled epidemic, that's an uncontrolled infection new to an area, it skyrockets rapidly and then it affects the population. There's a slowing, there's a peak, and then eventually the population will develop immunity, recover, and it'll come down. This line here is the most important line you're gonna be seeing in the United States of America. This line is a healthcare system capacity. In your head, make this line the number of beds we have in this country, the number of supplies we have in this country, the supplies being masks, gowns, and the number of staff we have in this country to take care of people. Those three factors are the healthcare capacity, beds, supplies, and staff. In this particular disease, there is a point in some countries where we've been able to mitigate or contain, which are the most important words we're gonna talk about today, and shift this into this. This graph shows what happens if you prevent the spread of the disease. And most importantly, it shows that you can stay under the healthcare capacity. In other words, we can take care of the people that are getting the disease. If you're sitting here and you're not worried, you will 100% go in this graph. If you lock down your community and by telling people not to go out, not to, to wash their hands, to practice social distancing, to not travel and spread the disease, to restrict people from visiting in and out of nursing homes and hospitals, and isolating positive patients. The more intense and intentional we are with those restrictive techniques, the more we can change the shape of this to this. History tells us one thing, and I'm gonna show you that, but not learning from history is, is a real big challenge that we have to face if we don't do a better job with this. And here's what I mean when I say history tells us something. 
1918, there was a flu epidemic across the, the world and the United States of America. This is a graph of a city that did not practice early containment and later mitigation techniques. This graph is of Philadelphia. This is a graph 900 miles away of the city of St. Louis that locked down their city, emptied out their playgrounds, and said, no one leave the house. If you look at these two, it is proof that this isn't just an academic graph of scientists sitting in a room. This is a reality of what happened in a flu epidemic that ended up taking millions and millions of lives across the planet. This is a picture of the parade in Philadelphia to celebrate World War I, uh, to celebrate people on the, uh, going to fight in battle. These are hundreds of thousands of people that came out to celebrate their troops in the middle of an epidemic. In 1918, they threw a parade in Philadelphia. 200,000 people were crammed together. Every bed was filled in the city three days later. Every ICU bed and every hospital bed was filled three days later. Philadelphia's politicians ultimately closed down the city. It was too late as 4,500 people had already died. In 1918, at the same time, 900 miles away, within two days of detecting the first case among civilians, the city closed schools, playgrounds, libraries, courtrooms, and even churches. Work shifts were staggered, and the streetcar ridership was limited to essential employees. Public gatherings were banned. And that's why St. Louis looked like this and Philadelphia looked like that. It's not actually, it's a, it's a number adjusted per population. This is a picture of O'Hare over last weekend. This is a picture of spring break two days ago. This is where we're practicing mitigation techniques right now. So we are telling people, do not congregate in a group. Practice social isolation or we will spread the disease. This, to me, looks like that parade. This is to nobody's fault. This was a, a series of events that have happened to result in this line being here, as you've seen on the news, for four hours. A positive patient sitting here where this X is, right, where this arrow is, can infect people six feet ahead, six people behind, six feet to the right, six feet to the left. A respiratory droplet from a single sneeze works in this area. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a video now that was posted on CNN. What am I doing? I'm sorry. I'm gonna show you a video now taken off of CNN Breakers are not avoiding the large crowds of these in the city of Clearwater Beach, Florida. You look around, people are still just living their lives and doing everything. The restaurants are packed, the beaches are packed. We're definitely still worried about it, but it's not something that we're like, letting consume or spring break, I guess. We're not real worried about it because we're on the stand and it's an open area. There's not a lot of doorknobs and not a lot of things you can touch. Officials in Clearwater Beach, they haven't decided if they're going to do the curfew or just all together close the beaches. They're not going to be able to vote on it. They could vote on it next week. Well, that's odd. Tired news. All right. So you'll see from that picture that there's different philosophies happening right now today in the United States of America. You, you don't have to look too far to understand what's happening when you don't practice containment and mitigation. So when we talk about healthcare in our hospital, it's just like every hospital in the city of Chicago, we have pooled resources set up to ramp up and gear up for taking care of patients with this disease. But there's a fixed number of beds, a fixed number of supplies, and a fixed number of staff that we have to take care of them. We are seeing entire cities like Seattle and now New York pass that line. When you have to take a boat in the modern world with a thousand beds and float it into New York City, if that can't convince people it's time to cancel these, these engagements and shut down spring break, we're going to look like the graph that you've seen from Philadelphia instead of the graph that you've seen in St. Louis. And each hospital can only take care of what they can take care of. The biggest opportunity is to minimize the number of people coming into the hospital. The other thing that I spent a lot of time talking about is safety of staff and what happens to staff. 
This was an actual ambulance bay in a hospital. What we actually did was take these chairs, tape them on the ground six feet apart, and set a forward triage area, or an area where before you get inside the hospital, you have to go through. The people that work inside this area are wearing all the right personal protective equipment to help themselves stay safe. The people that come into this area are people that are worried about having COVID infections. Initially, they had to have a risk factor. Today, they just have to have a respiratory symptom. This is overwhelming our emergency room. This is full. This has been full for the last several days. You come in here, you get evaluated. We have a walk-in COVID clinic where people can walk in and get a test. And we have a drive-through clinic that was so busy, we opened up another lane. At the end of the, the day, each day, we're, uh, we're given a higher number of people that are demanding a test. We have limitations in all of the resources that we have in this country. So I mentioned earlier three things, beds. We and the other hospitals in Chicago have emptied out, stopped elective cases, and are getting ready to prepare for what's happened in New York City. A massive number of critically ill patients that are coming in in volumes that we have not seen in the past, all of a sudden to overwhelm our structure. We are at risk of running out of supplies, as are many other cities. And we're waiting for we're coordinating with local and state officials to help provide more supplies. But what we cannot control is a rate of staff going down. A single exposure can take out 15 staff members and make it almost impossible to staff an emergency room. That's why you're seeing calls from the mayor of New York to say, if you're a retired physician, come back to work. We're seeing other states say, we're gonna lift the restrictions on licensing so if you're a licensed in one state, come in and practice. We're seeing a full call to arms. One of the most amazing things that happens in this country, the greatest country in the world in our opinion, simply is that we can come together at times like this and we're seeing the hospitals really start to pool their resources. What you're seeing here are some predictive analytics. We used a team that modeled out and created dynamic tools to look at how many beds you have if you're sick, how many patients are gonna happen over time. And you don't have to really focus on the details of this. What you have to simply focus on is the rate of confirmed cases. You want to be here. You do not want to be skyrocketing here. You want to take it and you want to lessen the curve and be better off. We're modeling out how many critical care beds we'll need. We're modeling how many overall beds we'll need to decide how we're best going to utilize our resources. At this point, both Dr. Lin, who's a nationally known epidemiologist, and I are happy to answer any of the questions that you've either mailed, that you've entered in on your chat screen, or that you've asked in advance. So thank you for the overview. Uh, there's, um, there's three um, categories of questions uh, that we've received in advance. Some are very specific to the virus. Others are to the healthcare system and its ability to handle the um, upcoming tsunami here. And then uh, finally, around the business community and what, our, what we can do as leaders to help. So let me start more specifically around the virus because there's just members have been confused and overwhelmed by the media, misinformation, and hype. So um, I want to start with some clarifying questions, even some, some, some things as simple as, you said six feet is the spread zone when you showed the picture at O'Hare. So can you tell us what we know about how long the virus can survive on hard surfaces, on cardboard, on paper, in the air? Okay. Uh, again, thank you for inviting us in. I'm Dr. Michael Lynn. Uh, so I want to tell you about the six feet rule, I guess, and why that came about. So um, this virus spreads by droplet, and what that means is when someone sneezes or coughs, um, that person produces some droplets that are, uh, the droplets are very heavy, they fall out of the air, and so if you think about a raindrop or a, a large water particle, it does not stay suspended in the air, but it, it's essentially a projectile going from the person's knees to a radius of about six feet. And so um, when we talk about how coronavirus spreads, we're talking about the radius of someone's sneeze and their ability to ballistically transmit a, a droplet of water, essentially from their mouth. There are um, some other types of illnesses um, that spread by what's called airborne, and this is a point of controversy in the medical literature, but I think it's now more settled. 
there are some diseases that actually spread by suspended smaller particles in the air. And this is a situation where you can walk into a room, sneeze, walk out, and those suspended water droplets, well, I should say airborne particles, can remain for hours and carry the virus and cause infection. That's going to be something like chickenpox um, that travels by airborne spread. So we think that coronavirus is primarily a droplet form of transmission. It's these heavy particles that don't stay suspended in the air. And so that's the origin of the six feet rule. The question about how long the virus remains viable on surfaces, that's still something that people are studying. But I think suffice it to say it's somewhere in the order of hours to days that a virus can stay viable on a surface. And it depends on things like the type of material and even the temperature and humidity. Uh, but I think because there's viable virus that stays on surfaces, we recommend hand washing because someone can sneeze on their hand, touch a doorknob, and then you come and touch that same doorknob and pick up the virus. Uh, and so washing your hands will prevent that from transmitting to you. Thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate the clarification. We talk a little bit more about, um, Dr. Latif, you said that, uh, that the virus can stay within your system for 14 days. Um, how soon after you encounter the virus is someone contagious? And how long after infection does that person remain contagious? Sure, yeah, I can, I can speak to that. So um, there is what Dr. Latif called the incubation period, where once you're exposed to the virus, it takes time for the virus to, to manifest symptoms in your body. And so that's the, on average, five days of the incubation period, but the range goes from one day to 14 days. Um, in terms of infectivity, we do think that people are most infectious when they actually have the symptoms, when they're sneezing or coughing. Uh, we don't think that asymptomatic transmission is a major part of spread. And so that's what drives a lot of what we do in terms of infection control, really making sure that when people have symptoms, whether they're in the community or if they're healthcare workers that are coming to work for us, that once they have any symptoms, even mild, that they stay away from work and shelter at home, basically, and self-isolate. In terms of after being infected, how long are you still infectious? This is something that's not completely clear, but the CDC has come out with guidance to say that approximately three days after you've finished or resolved your symptoms, um, you are considered to be um, not infectious. So um, there's a rule basically that we're following from CDC. If it's seven days after the onset of symptoms, and if it's three days after the resolution of your symptoms, whatever time period is longer, that's when a patient or a healthcare worker is released from isolation. And I would add to that, what's so fascinating about this time in history and this particular disease is that because it's novel and because we don't have tremendously uh, a tremendous wealth of shared resources, the information that changes, part of the reason there's so many different rumors out there about what this does is because information changes, even including from the CDC, on, on an every other day basis. On one time, you would need this type of isolation precaution. Another day, they're recommending this. We don't have access, specific access in detail to the 80,000 cases that happen in one country or the 20,000 cases that are happening here. What we're basing a lot of these conversations on are anecdotes, as well as as rapidly as we can put together scientific data and study it. It takes us in the scientific community quite a long time to cohort and share data to draw the right conclusions. We're at a time route where we're trying to do it in real time. And so we're trying to do it in real time. So this is a case in New York, this happened, and then we did this, and we flipped them upside down, and we got their oxygen better, trying to learn from that without you know, a, a really simple ability to share that information or to study off of large numbers of trends, like 47 people that look like this did better with this. We just don't have that now. Got it. So, um, so let me ask a little bit more about um, how is this, is this uh, virus different from SARS, MERS, some of the others that, we've, uh, that we have been able to contain? Great question. So um, everything that you mentioned, the COVID-19 virus, SARS, MERS, what's in common with them is that they are novel coronaviruses. These are coronaviruses that came from wild animals and got into the human population where there was no immunity. I would say that SARS in particular is different from the novel coronavirus that we have today, the COVID-19, because the SARS caused more severe disease. And once someone came down with it, you knew exactly who had SARS. 
that allowed the healthcare community to identify people with SARS, isolate them, and prevent transmission to other people. COVID-19 is different. It causes a spectrum of illness. There are some people who really have very mild or almost no symptoms. Some people who, as Dr. Latif mentioned, have very severe symptoms. But because there's a spectrum of illness, it's much harder to identify and isolate patients ahead of time in, in a timely manner. So we're, we're finding that the biology of this COVID-19 virus is preventing containment. What makes this so hard is that there's a, a group of patients that look good. They feel okay. I might have a little bit of a sore throat. I'm going to hop on this airplane, go visit my nanny in Florida. That, to them, the disease is mild, but they're carrying the same disease that in another population, like an elderly grandmother, which is what the Surgeon General has said on television, you may feel okay, but your nanny won't feel okay, is carrying that and transporting it. We're calling these, these vectors or hosts can look relatively good. The other thing that's so different that's worth calling out that Dr. Lynn had mentioned was that this last 14, this can be for any place in a 14-day period where a person is relatively asymptomatic can be walking around spreading it. If it was a two-day period, it'd be much easier to contain it because it's easier to control people for a two-day period and say, don't go out. We're talking about major lifestyle changes to cover a 14-day period. So let me talk about that because I, I think uh, your um, sharing of the video um, and the, the spring break in Florida uh, was uh, illustrative. Um, we, how long, a couple questions here, how long before it becomes painfully obvious that this is not to be taken in a cavalier way and another member uh, submitted a question saying, why can't we just limit shelter in place to those over 60 um, and let the less vulnerable live their life? <laughs> so I'll do the first part, and then I'll try. I don't, uh, the, the, the next question is a little more challenging. So the first part is, when do we take this more seriously? Part of the biggest challenge of dealing with this type of disease is at the point where it becomes obvious to take it seriously, it's too late because the spread has already happened. You have to take it seriously before you see people with the disease. You have to prevent it from coming into your community because once it's in your community, it becomes uncontrollable without draconian methodology. So there is a YouTube video that's floating around that is absolutely remarkable that we could send a link to which has people living in Italy in containment talking to themselves 10 days earlier. And when they're talking, they're talking saying, why didn't you take this seriously? Why did you go outside to fly a kite on that beautiful day? Or why did you go jogging with your friends in a running group when four out of eight of their friends are now sick and two of them are in the hospital? The reality is there's enough history there. If you look at pictures from the destruction of Wuhan, like what does it take for a nation to build up pop-up hospitals in two weeks before a person's convinced that it's a big deal. So part of the confusion on the medical community is how do you take that and say this will spread through a community and cause great destruction like it did in, in parts of China and now what it's doing in Italy is an unprecedented modern day destruction of, of the city. The other thing that I would say um, with respect to that is that if, if the, the numbers, people talk a lot about the numbers. Well, it's only 1%, it's only 2%. It's a, really a 3% chance if I'm in this population. You know, I heard somebody say the other day, if I took 100 Skittles and three, and, and, and three of them would kill you, would you eat the Skittles? And nobody I know would just stick their hand in and arbitrarily grab a bunch of Skittles and start eating it. This is what we're talking about. Predictions of 2.2 million deaths in the United States have come out from scholar epidemiologists in Europe based on what's happening there without containment. But, the, I, you know, I finish up on what the World Health Organization is very clear on is it's never too late to aggressively contain and mitigate this disease. Yeah, I, we're hearing the message, so very good. Let's keep going. Uh, other questions that came in around the disease, and then I'm going to switch to the medical um, health care system capabilities. But um, will, when does this go away? Is it seasonal, like the flu? Will it subside in warmer weather? So this is something that everyone's trying to predict. Uh, you know, to use the 1918 flu pandemic as an example, that came in very quickly, caused all kinds of mortality and destruction, and then it established itself as a seasonal flu for the next, say, 30 to 40 years. And so 
Um, we think that now that this novel coronavirus has established itself um, in the human population, that it's not going to go away. There's, it's going to become a seasonal coronavirus. And it's going to take some time before we can actually you know, um, get to the point where we feel comfortable with our healthcare capacity and control. I guess that in terms of actual numbers, I would say that, uh, as Dr. Latif showed, in a lot of countries, in China, for example, it's about a three to four month initial wave. Uh, we don't know about subsequent waves, but even the 1918 pandemic had three independent waves that came and went. And as long as you have a population that's still vulnerable, uh, that possibility still exists. So it's difficult to predict, but we would say that this is going to be a seasonal virus. Um, does warm weather help? We don't know that uh, answer. We know that in warm weather places right now, like in Australia and in Singapore, they experience their own epidemics. And so we think that while there may be some impact on weather, it's not going to save us. Okay. So understanding that um, this may be something we're going to be challenged with for a while, what do you think uh, is the toolkit that's, a, that's being pulled together to address how to control this long term? What are the, what are the things under, under, um, under work right now, under, underway right now? Okay. Yeah. So I think the most important thing is going to be two aspects. One is a vaccine, because I think what's successful with the flu, which is in some seasons very deadly, is the idea that we can get vaccines out to people and to create that immunity that's missing right now, since this is a, a novel virus. As you may have seen from projections, that's still going to be a 12 to 18 month process, uh, optimistically, just because there's a lot of effort that has to go into testing the effectiveness and also the safety of any new vaccine. Um, so I think it's going to be a dynamic between um, vaccine development and also just the dynamics of the population immunity. So I think China is an example where, unfortunately, they had a huge spike in terms of number of people affected. But the population reached a point where there was enough people with immunity that the virus had a hard time propagating itself. And we are probably going to reach that point um, with a, even a flattened curve, we're going to reach a point where many people in the population are going to develop immunity, and that itself will be able to slow down the virus. Anything else? No, I would, I would add the same thing. That concept of herd immunity, when enough people get infected and recover, they're not going to continue to reinfect the population, and that will slow that curve down dramatically. That, we believe, will, is likely to happen in the United States prior to a vaccine being available. So there's a short-term win. A short-term solution, which is what we're doing now, which is immediate containment and mitigation. And then there's a long-term plan, which is develop a vaccine to, to develop, to, to provide that immunity to people so that when it comes back each year, they don't have it. And I've also um, heard that there's some, some tests being proposed or to look at current drugs that are already available to try yeah. and, uh, and utilize those. Can you comment on that? Sure. Yeah. So. There are developmental treatments that are um, currently being studied. You know, we are a site where we're going to be um, providing that for our patients. Uh, but just like any clinical trial, it's, it's a trial. We have patients who are going to get the medication and then placebo. And um, we don't really know if the trial is going to, the treatment's going to work until we get the results back several months from now. So uh, every drug looks good at the beginning, but you don't really know. So at this point, where we are in terms of um, COVID-19 treatment, it's still primarily supportive. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, we're going to be providing um, airway support, ventilator support, and support for the patient so that its immune system, the patient's immune system can fight off the virus. And that's all about critical care that Dr. Latif knows so well. Okay. So let's talk about how you're going to do this short term, because it looks like we're uh, up against the battle here. Um, can you speak to how the Chicago hospitals are collaborating to combat this? Sure. I think that I think there's one thing we learned um, that we did exceptionally well with the Chicago Department of Public Health around Ebola, which was we got in a room together and hospitals that historically compete with one another shared resources, ideas, and we did a call schedule between one another. And um, we can grow together as a community and come together very nicely in healthcare. Um, to face challenges. And so that same feeling or emotion is there now. We know that through the Illinois Hospital Association, they've crowdsourced various groups with CEOs to meet with the mayor's office and the Chicago Department of Public Health daily. There's a daily call with the CMO of the Chicago Department of Public Health and all of the chief medical officers in the city of Chicago, in the city of Chicago and 
broader surrounding areas, and we know the governor is doing the same thing. We feel confident that there's that that these groups politically are are using their influence to get us to work together. So from a collaboration perspective, we're there. Not every hospital has the same capabilities. And so what where organization and operations are critical are being able to ensure that the hospitals function seam, seamlessly with one another. So these are the number of negative pressure rooms. This is where there's an open ventilator. This is where the worried well can go and get evaluated. Somebody who's relatively healthy, who just got off a private plane coming back from Italy, who has a cold, should, should not come to a place that has 84 people on a ventilator, right? And that's the challenge, and that's a city health and a state health challenge for us to organize. The other thing that I would say um, to answer maybe some of the, uh, the incoming questions are, the limitations are not going to be us being able to work together. The limitations are going to be us collectively running out of either beds, which we've seen in New York City, supplies, which we have yet to see, but there's a great fear of, we're hearing anecdotal reports of institutions running out of some of the supplies of protective equipment, but we haven't experienced that in our hospital and the other hospitals that we know of in Chicago. But staff, staffing shortages can happen like that. An exposure in an ER can wipe out half of your crew for 14 days. But it's a shorter period if we have testing. And that goes to one of the bigger questions that everybody seems to have is, is do we have a testing issue? The answer to that question is absolutely. We have a testing problem right now in the city, in the state, and in the country. There are other countries that have done, that have nowhere near our numbers that can do three times the number of tests we have. If we could test employees, we can get them back into the workforce quicker. They're not sitting at home waiting. If a test takes three days, that's three days they're unable to work. People that go into healthcare want to make a difference at every level of the organization. And so we have to be able to ramp that up as a nation as soon as possible. So, um, so you talk about beds, supplies, and staff, and testing, which uh, I know there's been a discussion that uh, uh, we're working on doing this additional testing. Um, are you doing your own test kits? How is that yeah. being handled right now? Yeah, so in, in the absence of any other testing, many of the hospitals in Chicagoland, and I believe most of them, will develop their own testing. Ours were up and running on Monday. We test 90 to 100 people a day. We expect to test close to two to 300 and then 500 by next week. Those are really large numbers. We're not there. Those depend on us having the right reagent, the right equipment, the right resources, and we're hearing rumors that those are hard to come by. And so we are ramped up to do more and more each day, but we don't control some of the limitations in the hospital, as do our partner hospitals in the city. So testing has to get ramped up, and once that gets ramped up, that will dramatically help us change the trajectory by increasing our workforce and allowing us earlier to isolate people. What can we do uh, as a business community? What can we do as, uh, in, as public, general public, to help ramp up the testing and the uh, capabilities there? Well, so I'll answer that in two ways. So one is what can, so I get a lot of questions, and one of the reasons I was excited to talk to this um, sort of very prestigious group, and it's an honor for both uh, Dr. Lynn and I to, to present to you today, is to sort of make an appeal. One is around the idea of taking this seriously. What we are seeing overwhelmingly, and I mentioned today that there was a lot of traffic coming down the freeway today, just coming down 290 and where, where the construction hit on 290, there was that bottleneck, and I was shocked to see it because we just don't need people out if they don't need to be out. So what, what leaders in large businesses can do, what large employers can do, what leaders in the community and civic engaged minded people can do is tell people to get off the streets and stay at home. Don't get into large groups of people. Listen to everybody that's talking who's dedicated their life to science and infectious diseases, which is to stay home and to not get in a large crowd. In terms of testing, this is a mind boggling issue for us. We have the ability to do this. There are international tests available, but there's limitations on getting licensing and using those tests in the United States. To the extent that we can crowdsource enthusiasm to push our national government, our state, our local governments, all of us to work together to figure out where to bring tests in from, get them approved, and get them in the hands of everybody that can use them as fast as possible, 
that would be advantageous for every healthcare provider in this country. Okay. Well, we heard the call to action. Uh, let me uh, ask a few more questions, and then I'll, I'll touch more on business uh, and what we can think about that. But the questions I had around the hospital, I was on a call this morning that uh, Senator Durbin spoke about the possibility of standing up field hospitals built by military in the parking lots of our current hospitals in case we need that, um, that surge of uh, capacity. There was also a discussion about uh, how do we create step-down facilities as patients start to recover so we can quickly clear them through the beds. Uh, and this goes right to your chart that you showed about the peak versus trying to keep it more of a, an even uh, level so that we can accommodate. Can you speak to that? Yes, uh, absolutely. So right now today in our hospital, we have uh, homeless people that were COVID positive, right? Or people that are being ruled out for COVID. That ha we can't just discharge them out onto the street, but they're taking a vital resource that we need for the next person in. Today in Chicago, we are almost full in our ICUs on a normal basis. We're on bypass quite frequently. Bypass means the ICU beds are filled in this country, in a city. And when, our, when a hospital goes on bypass, right, they go to the next hospital up. We can't afford to be on bypass when the numbers get higher. And so to not be on bypass, we have to be able to effectively move patients through or have throughput. What will help throughput are for those Patients that are ill but not critically ill, those are the videos you're seeing come out of Italy of large care, like what look like almost sports complexes with beds every 10 feet away. What helps you get throughput is, all right, I need to have a doctor monitoring these patients. They need to be protected from society, but I can put them in one area. That's where the idea of taking old dormitories, old resources, when, they, when people say parking lots, I don't know that it's feasible to use the outside. But certainly a covered area that you can keep warm is exactly what we did at our institution to dramatically elevate our surge capacity. We can flex up. Every hospital can flex up. If we have to, we'll put beds in the hallways. We'll put beds in closets. Everybody will. This is an all-hands-on-deck phenomenon. But there's a limitation to that, right? And I think what, what, what the reality is and what Senator Durbin is doing is listening without a doubt to his colleagues in New York where the governor of New York stood on national TV and said, we need the Army Corps of Engineers to build pop-up hospitals. That is what happens once the logarithmic curve takes off, if you wait too long for containment. I still believe that we can contain and still mitigate and change the course of this disease in this country, but it, it requires an all-in philosophy. But if we don't do that, you're going to see those in Chicago. Got it. Okay. And that, I think, will be the painfully obvious moment when we start to see all of this happening at a very um, high scale. So let's talk more from uh, the business uh, community. And you've given us the appeal in terms of how we can help even the test kits and, and getting the, the message out. Um, what other things do we, as a, as a business community, think about um, beyond social isolation, beyond hyper-sanitation and cleaning of our premises? beyond educating our employees? What, what, what more can we do? I think as a business community, the, the, the challenges uh, that are no different. So, so our medical center is an employer as well as is a healthcare provider. And so the overwhelming concern on the part of our employees are if you cut elective surgeries, which we've done, am I going to have a job? Are we going to have layoffs? Uh, we've dramatically emptied out the hospital for people that are non-essential. And so the fear that exists in the environment over what happens to us next is one that has presented a daunting challenge for us, is how to overcome that fear around employment. I am sure that is the same fear felt in large businesses all over this nation. If you're in the airline industry right now, there are employees that are just staffing empty planes that are tremendously scared of the future of entire industries. And so what I would say is for the business community, and us included, we're relying on faith that we're going to do the right thing, but that the government will offer support and resources for heroic efforts during this time. And any support that the, the communities can have of one another is where we have to figure out how to get to. Got it. And so for some of the businesses that are still open and must remain open, like you, 
as an employer, but that others that are running critical infrastructure operations, should they be conducting temperature checks for all employees as they enter the premises? What, what type of safety precautions That's would you recommend? Question, Mike, I take that. That's a great question. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of business you have. I think you have to make sure that your workforce is healthy and that they're not coming and bringing the virus um, to infect others. And we've come across a lot of situations already where it just takes one employee who is diagnosed with the COVID-19 virus to really throw the whole office upside down uh, with panic or confusion. So I do think that, you know, I'll just say that Chicago Department of Public Health has recommended our, our healthcare workers take their temperature twice a day at home. Um, we define a fever as greater than or equal to 100.0 Fahrenheit, and also to look for any mild symptoms of respiratory illness, such as shortness of breath, cough, sore throat. So those are things that I think businesses can take to heart also and protect their own uh, workforce by adopting the same measures. Okay, so if we do have somebody that has been exposed to the virus, if we do have an employee that we become aware of, then what do we need to do for the other employees? So sh Chicago and, and the other um, public health departments have evolved over time just trying to be pragmatic about isolation and quarantine. So um, I guess I'll start with the, the simplest uh, part, which is the person who has COVID-19 disease needs to stay home, be isolated from everyone else, including especially the workers in the office, stay home until the symptoms have resolved. And that's, again, the seven-day, three-day rule where it's, they have to be isolated for at least seven days after the initial onset of symptoms. And then they had to remain isolated for three days beyond the resolution of their symptoms, whatever total duration is longer. And then for the other health, the other workers in the office who may have been exposed to that sick employee, uh, right now the public health departments are really trying to take a symptom-based approach to isolation. So those workers can continue working, but as soon as they have an elevated temperature, again, that fever of greater than or equal to 0, 100.0 Fahrenheit, or if they have any mild symptoms of respiratory illness, they need to leave the workplace immediately and go home and isolate. So I think that's practical um, for at least maintaining the, the workforce. And I think, as Dr. Latif mentioned, I guess one step beyond that, which is important, is to allow workers to work from home as much as possible to improve that social distancing. I think, I think those two strategies would um, be the best approach to maintaining the workforce and that's what we're doing in our hospital, and all hospitals are trying to follow that. I, I completely agree. Okay. So I think let's talk about this. If, uh, if, if uh, what's kind of the protocol that you get employees not feeling well, tell them not to come in clearly. Um, but if you know employees have been um, around someone who has now been diagnosed, inform all of them and make sure that they're self-quarantining. Or how do how do you do? What's the rest? Of the no, it's a great question. I think, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, well, are you exposed to this person or that person in the office? Do they have COVID-19? And do we treat the exposed people differently than those who are not exposed? The reality is now that COVID-19 is everywhere in, in Chicago. Not exactly everywhere, but we think that it's broad enough that, you know, you don't have to be just working next to that person who's sneezing at work. You could be going to the grocery store shopping and touching that doorknob or that shopping cart that somebody else who's sick has just touched. So the exposure part has become less important now, even just in the past week, I would say. It's become less important, and we're focused all on symptoms now. So if you're sick, go home. If you're not showing symptoms, you can still work. That's, that's at least for the essential um, businesses like in healthcare, that's how we're approaching things. Okay. And, um, and when do we know that it's gonna be all clear? Um, how, how long should we be expecting to work from home? This is, this is a question that it's, I don't think I can answer right now because it's all dependent on the curve. It's dependent on where we think we are in terms of immunity and vaccines and things like that. Um, so it's going to be, I think, a month-by-month -month basis. But I would say my projection, this is more my personal projection, is at least we're just looking at this first wave and trying to survive this. I think this, the first wave will be the, the most important one, the biggest peak. And I think if we can survive the first wave, then I think public health, us in the healthcare profession, we can talk about how to mitigate the rest of the potential waves that come down the line. I think you can also, to answer that, look at other countries and countries that had 
um, draconian containment and mitigation approaches recovered in months. Um, uh, Wuhan is back to life. Uh, Wuhan is an active, thriving city again yesterday uh, with no new cases reported in that entire city with a population of 12 million people. I think you can look at Italy, and Italy still has numbers today that are moving up the curve, so there's no way to predict what happened. What you can look at is if you contain it today, that will quell the curve two weeks from today because there's already people that are going to be developing symptoms over time. So if you're on your way up on the curve, you can't predict how long you're going to have it in a community. If you're tapered off or on your way down, you can start modeling that out. And what, what that actually means is there's more infected people every day in Chicago than there was the day before. And because of that, there's no telling when this stops. Now, if tomorrow every single person in Chicago is not allowed to live in their house, they're not allowed to leave their home and have to live in a bubble, in a bu magic bubble that has food and water and everything that you need, that no interaction, then in 14 days we'll have suddenly a decline. Right, because it's just physiological, man scientifically mandated, nobody will be spreading the disease in that period. Right, but you, you'll still have an increase in the 14 days. It's, it'll take two weeks before that number is affected by the actions that are done today. Got it. So tell me, I've got two, two more questions as we wrap up. One, personally, what are each of you doing to protect yourselves and your families? So the first question, so I'll, I'll take a stab at this first. So um, you could probably see, because I didn't realize you were actually going to be on the video, so I'm wearing scrubs and a hoodie. Uh, we're both doctors and, and interact with patients at the same time where we're, we're both uh, have administrative roles and responsibilities. And uh, at the end, the same thing that we're doing we're, is what we're telling other people to do. We're practicing all at work the personal protective equipment, we're adhering to the six feet rule wherever appropriate, um, we're washing our hands aggressively, where, which is hand washing and hand washing and mitigating the effects. With all of that said, the founding physician who blew the whistle on what this was developed a significantly severe case of, of COVID-19. So, you know, this is what healthcare workers do in every city, in every country, in the world, this is what healthcare workers do. In terms of our family, I'm also I'm married to a physician. Um, I, I, she has an understanding of it. Uh, you just go home and uh, take a shower and hope for the best. But at the end of the day, there is some optimism here. And so I don't mean to paint such a grim picture. And the optimism is people that get it overwhelmingly do recover. Our, uh, we're a resilient city in a resilient state in a resilient country, and we will absolutely recover. Um, but we have to be cognizant and respectful of this particular infection. So personally, it's, it's, a, it's a fear. It's a fear that I think we all have. And when your friends start getting it and then recover, that fear will go away. But in healthcare, we all have it. Mike? Yeah, no, I think I, I, I would echo the same thing as Dr. Latif said. I think all of us have and accept the, the risk that we have in the healthcare profession. And every time we see a patient, not just in the COVID-19 era, but in other settings, you know, we do take some risks. I think um, the best way that we try to mitigate it is doing the simple things like keeping calm, washing our hands. And and we, I just came back from doing a video for our staff to talk about personal protective equipment. We do have, and we follow um, CDC guidelines for how to protect staff. Uh, we wear gloves, you know, we wear special masks that when we're taking care of a sick patient who's coughing, will protect us from catching the disease. So. Um, I don't do anything more than just the things that public health is saying that everyone else does, which is social distancing. We do a lot of webinars here ourselves to try to maintain that distance as best we can. So um, there are limits. You can't reduce the risk down to zero, but we're, we're trying to do everything that you guys are told to do as well. Well, thank you. Again, thank you for your service. So my final question before we wrap up is, um, I know you're not a psychiatrist, but what would you advise for people to keep uh, that optimistic, upbeat spirit while they're um, home with their children and trying to work from home and teach their children at the same time? Um, how do we maintain mental well-being during these difficult weeks ahead? I think one of the things that's so interesting um, that comes out of moments like this, and, and not to sound cliche, but is the resiliency of our population. You see 
videos come out of uh, parents um, with hints today on how to make your day exciting. You see people uh, doing crafts online and doing online crafts or Zoom book clubs have sprouted out, sprouted out all over Chicago. So what I find so remarkable is the creativity of our population, and I find that so inspiring. And they're at home, and so notes like don't hoard, but make those things you've always wanted to make for your family and learn how to cook that really difficult meal because now you have time. So you can work from home, but take the advantages of being at home and spend a little more time perhaps reading or reading to your family and doing things like that. And so I'm, I, I do believe there's cause for optimism. I do believe there's cause for enthusiasm because we do as a society tend to come together in these, in these terrible moments. And I will say that as bad as it is in the healthcare front, mm -hmm. we're seeing so much resilience come out of, of our community. I don't have much else to add. I think that's great. I, I, I think that there's a lot of love coming out of the community that I see and everything that we're doing, the social distancing and all that, it's really just, it's to protect ourselves, but I think there's an altruism to mm -hmm. it, to protect the unnamed person who's vulnerable and who, who may get really sick or even die from this disease. So when we talk about all this social distancing, all the efforts that are happening uh, across the world, I think it's, it is an act of fear in some ways, but also I see it maybe glass half full as an act of love to really protect those that are the most vulnerable. So I think if we have that in mind, I think that helps to frame perhaps this, uh, all this happening and, and why we're doing it. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, I love that analogy. So I want to wrap us up to just by, by saying thank you once again, Dr. Latif, uh, Dr. Lynn, for giving us your precious time today in light of the, I'm sure, unbelievable demands on you and your team. We are indebted to you uh, and your team for your service to our community. We're very, very grateful. Um, to our members who are listening, uh, we are always interested in your feedback from today's program. And we will be sending a survey on this program tomorrow, along with requests for other ideas for future programs that we can convene virtually as we follow the self-quarantine that we heard we need to do today and um, with a great case for that. So to all on the line and to you too, please stay safe. Uh, and to all of our members at the Economic Club of Chicago, please help out these incredible healthcare professionals to help mitigate the spread of this virus. Show the love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.